Um, anyway, um, Pauline has been so generous to me in inviting me to sort of write a chapter in that wonderful book that came out in 2019, the first and only time I've been in a book with Jeremy Corbyn, and uh, that's an honor. Um, and so um, my talk is actually slightly different than the chapter, if you happen to have seen my chapter, although there's incredible overlap, right? And so um, continuing on, whoops, there's my mistakes. So Eugene Debs and, and, and Keir Hardy um, share much in common, um, knew each other, if only sort of in a, a very sort of modest way, um, and um, are deeply interested in my opinion. And, um, but I would say that I'm largely going to be talking about Eugene Debs here, um, whose birth dates is almost identical to Keir Hardy's, right, and sort of lived about the same amount of time. Um, both were um, important labor leaders who then went on to become important political leaders. And as I'll talk a little about, Keir Hardy um, actually met De Debs for the first time when Debs was in the middle of his ongoing conversion to socialism, which is no doubt important. I should say that before I um, was contacted by Pauline, I confess I never had heard of Keir Hardy and I'm embarrassed to admit it. Um, but I can tell you that very few Americans know Keir Hardy, right? Um, I'm not saying that's good, but I'm saying that is the way it is, right? Eugene Debs, also not a household name in the United States. Um, if Americans in the 2020s um, identify as sort of left, they might've heard of Eugene Debs. Historians of course have, um, but Debs isn't a household name by any means either. So like comparatively speaking, right? Um, that is the way it is. However, um, in both our countries and other places, right? Um, changes are afoot. And so I actually believe that Debs and Hardy for that matter are both as relevant and perhaps more well-known today than they might've been one or two generations ago. Um, and I'm going to largely, like I said, sort of focus on Debs and the interconnections with Hardy. I work on the assumption that all of you know Keir Hardy's vibes better than I do. Um, so Eugene Debs was really sort of an important American um, born before the US Civil War began um, in a time when actually what now we call the Midwest was sort of the frontier. Right. Uh, Debs was a, in a way born just a generation after Indiana had become a state, for example. And although the frontier had pushed further westward by the mid 1800s, by the 1850s and 60s, it still was sort of very much in its infancy. Right. Um, Eugene Debs's parents actually had immigrated from Alsace in what is now France, uh, Colmar, right, um, which is maybe for people in the UK thought of more as sort of a wine holiday before Brexit, um, but nevertheless is um, where he's from, right on the Franco-German border. Terre Haute is on the Illinois-Indiana border, not a big town. Um, it was uh, though important, it's on a river and it was on a major railroad line. And so Terre Haute um, was sort of an interesting place and probably in the 1850s and 60s and 70s was actually more bustling than it is in the 21st century. Um, uh, Debs um, was born into a middle-class family. Um, although like many young people, he dropped out of school at a very young age and went to work um, with the support of his parents and help his family a little. Um, and like many young men, um, boys really, he got a job on the railroads, right? Um, and so he did various jobs on the railroads. First, his job was to like clean grease off the trucks, which is to say the wheels, right, uh, on the rails. Um, he later um, worked as a painter um, and a scraper. He actually had a, a paint scraper, which he kept with him for his whole life um, and sort of hung on the wall um, to remind him of the hard work he had done um, as a blue collar laborer as a child, right? Um, and then he ended up working for a number of years as a fireman, as it was referred to in the US, um, also sometimes called a stoker, right? Someone who basically shoveled the coal into these, um, the coal driven steam engine that powered trains. And this was also a job on ships, right? Um, stokers and firemen, um, hard work, dangerous, dirty, um, not considered highly skilled, yeah, um, but nevertheless an important job. It was there that he became active in a trade union which in the US, the railroad unions were often called railroad brotherhoods. Of course, that tells us a lot about America because it was a gendered um, occupation like almost every other. And so it was an all male workforce at that time, right? Um, sort of boiled into the name, right? Um, and it was also at this time that Jets became increasingly already at a young age, very interested in unionism, but also sort of helping out other people. Um, he's often sort of 
attributed to sort of being a very quintessential 19th American. And that includes sort of having a very idealistic view of America and the sort of Abe Lincoln tradition, um, but also of Christianity, right? But in a social justice sort of Christianity, right? Um, or sometimes called a social gospel Christianity, right? Um, he married um, around the age of 30 to a woman named Kate Metzel in, in, in Terre Haute. They never had children and they lived in Terre Haute their whole life. Right, although Debs traveled constantly, um, but his wife um, pretty much remained in Terre Haute and kept house. And the house where they lived um, is actually a museum, right? And the home of the Eugene Debs Foundation has been for some years, right? Um, you know, uh, Debs worked as a clerk in a dry goods store, which is to say a department store, basically. Um, he got elected to city clerk and then to a state legislative office, but he didn't really like that. He was a Democrat. That time, most um, working class Americans were Democrats, although it somewhat varied. Um, he was most passionate about unionism, right? And so even though he had stopped working on the railroads, he actually ended up being um, a union organizer in the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen and then elevated ultimately to become the leader, um, which was called the Grand Secretary Treasurer, as well as typically at that time, an, a newspaper editor, right? Um, it was in this capacity really that Debs becomes important um, because Debs didn't think that the railroad brotherhoods were very logical, that different jobs on the railroads were in different unions, even though they all had the same employer in the same industry. And so what was called in America craft or skilled um, unionist, were sort of um, considered diametrically opposed to another model of organizing, which was called industrial organizing, where everyone who works in the same industry is in a single union, right? Um, both models actually still exist in the United States. We still have craft unions, like say the carpenters, but we also have industrial unions, say like the steel workers, right? Um, and so that is of course not unique to the United States, but actually this is a huge debate in the 19th and 20th century in many trade union circles, what's the best way to organize? Right, um, uh, skilled workers often saw themselves as number one and in a way sort of didn't care much about other workers, right? Um, and so uh, those who believed in industrial unionism believed that basically it was not only would workers be more powerful, it would be sort of more inclusive, right? Um, and so when uh, Debs helps lead the formation of a new union called the American Railway Union or the ARU in 1893, it was seen as a challenge to the existing brotherhoods, right? Um, more sort of um, radical. Right. Um, and when the ARU was founded, Debs was elected first president and uh, 150,000 people joined um, within months. Right. Um, at that time, I'm just guessing for the second, um, there was probably 800,000 to a million people who worked in railroads in the U.S. in uh, the late 1800s. Right. Um, Debs notably argued in favor of including African-Americans, um, which would have been unusual for a white person, even a white leftist at that time. Um, white laborism or sort of socialists who identify as socialists but are also rights racist was typical in many places um, in the UK, in Australia, in, in, in South Africa are the sort of most well-known examples of white laborism, right? People who identify as being anti-capitalist but also sort of white supremacist, right? Debs wasn't, right? Um, However, he wasn't uh, the majority, and so the ARU actually wasn't open to African-American workers, which um, now might be seen as a mistake. Um, the ARU actually won a big strike against a major railroad called the Great Northern, which ran across the Northern Plains, say the Dakotas, Montana, into Washington State. Um, and that was sort of uh, very impressive, especially considering there had been a depression that had begun, generally when unemployment is higher, workers are weaker. Um, in 1894, that same year, um, Debs actually helps to lead the most important strike perhaps um, in late 19th century America. In 1894, in a, a, a suburb of Chicago called Pullman, um, I know that Pullman cars were also well used in Britain, right? Um, Pullman cars were sleeper cars and um, uh, dining cars, right? And they were all manufactured by the Pullman company just outside of Chicago. Um, and when the depression hit, um, George Pullman, the owner, um, slashed wages and laid off workers, but didn't reduce the rents on the housing. And he owned the entire town of Pullman, meaning he was both landlord and employer, right? And so he cut your wages, but he didn't cut your rent, right? Um, and so there was growing anger at Pullman in 1894. And so Pullman workers, many of whom were affiliated to the ARU, went on strike. Now, the ARU is a little nervous here. Pullman is uh, a very important, powerful company, and the railroads are powerful. Right? If you go out on strike in the midst of a Great Depression, that could backfire. Right? Um, and so with some trepidation, nevertheless, the ARU National Convention votes to support the Pullman strike, which would mean that any worker 
who respects the strike of the Pullman workers will not handle Pullman cars anywhere in the country. Right. And so what was actually a local affair becomes a national affair so that if you work on the railroads in Virginia or California and you respect the strike, you um, either don't work on a train that has Pullman cars on it or you decouple the Pullman cars. Right. Um, and leave them in the depot. Right. Um, the effect of this is actually a huge snarl. Right. Uh, both in Chicago, which is the heart of the um, uh, transportation hub of the United States, but also around the country where Pullman cars were basically stuck, but often you couldn't decouple cars. And so essentially hundreds of thousands of workers respected this strike or boycott um, and hundreds of thousands of others were indirectly affected. Right. Um, and often we use the terms boycott and strike interchangeably in this context, although um, it doesn't really matter. Right, like uh, Debs is the leader of this strike, and uh, he's therefore seen as the sort of the leader of a strike that's essentially shut down the transportation industry, which is the most important industry in any economy. Right, like uh, as goods can't be delivered and people can't be delivered. And so this is a famous image actually from uh, Chicago. If you know Chicago, um, it's full of, there's uh, several rivers that run through it and there's all these bridges that pivot on a central pillar, right? Although now they almost never do, right? Um, but there's still dozens and dozens of bridges that look like the one that the Debs character is sort of sitting atop, right? Like uh, here in Chicago. So here we see King Debs, right? Being depicted as powerful. Right, because um, that's what kings are, they're powerful. Um, this is actually a critical cartoon of Debs because of course Americans hate monarchs, right? And so um, we shouldn't like someone who's a king. Debs very clearly is a sort of um, leading this union that has just shut down in the summer, early summer of 1894. Um, like I said, the most important industry in the most important industrial city in the country that then shoots out in all directions um, nationwide. Right, many companies hate Debs. Um, the New York Times, which now is seen as a liberal paper, um, very always was uh, very much a paper of capital, right? Um, and is highly critical of the strike and of Debs himself, um, referred to as a lawbreaker, an enemy of the human race. Now, um, just to sort of move this story a little quicker, right? So the Attorney General, um, who's in charge of the Department of Justice in the United States, um, was a lawyer who formerly had worked for railroads. The railroads basically have organized a, an association, you might call this organized capital, right? Um, to sort of try to end the strike. Um, working with the US federal government, uh, colluding, you could say, um, the Attorney General says, put US mail on the Pullman cars. So therefore workers can be found guilty of interfering with the delivery of US mail, which is actually a federal crime um, if you do that, right? Um, a federal judge quickly grants an injunction, right? Saying that uh, the Pullman strike is interfering with the delivery of the US mail. Uh, the US president, Grover Cleveland, pictured here, um, quickly uh, sort of sends in tens of thousands of US soldiers. It is incredibly rare for the United States to uh, president to send soldiers inside the country Right, where we have a police force that's intended to sort of enforce domestic law and the US Army isn't only supposed to be used for um, external threats, right? Um, despite what the most recent president did last summer in Washington DC, right? Um, as soon as the um, uh, US troops were dispatched, conflicts um, emerged where pre previously there was a peaceful strike, dozens of people were killed, hundreds wounded, and basically the uh, strike was crushed, right? Because the United States Army is able to sort of um, start to move the trains again where previously um, strikers had been able to uh, prevent the movement of many railroads across the country. Um, Debs and a number of other leaders were sentenced to prison um, for violating the injunction. It's in this year when Eugene Debs goes to prison that Keir Hardy first visits the United States of America, of course by ship, uh, arriving in New York City Harbor, pictured here um, in the 18, well, this is an image from the 1890s. Like Pauline thoughtfully um, sort of said, you know, Hardy wanted to see the United States, which already was the most, uh, the most powerful industrial economy in the world, if not the most powerful country in the world, I'd say Britain still was, but you know, economically the statistics are clear, right? The United States was already um, the, the mightiest economic uh, power in the world by that time. And Hardy, as had Karl Marx and many other European socialists were looking to the United States, yeah, to be basically the um, future of socialism, right? Um, as a sort of, uh, you know, um, yeah, that, that could lead the world literally to socialism. And Hardy spent several months, I believe it was his largest or longest visit to the United States was his first one. And of course he would have traveled by railroad um, uh, when he did. Um, when Hardy arrived, he spent some time in New York City, 
But then he traveled um, to Chicago um, where he delivered a Labor Day speech. As you may know, Labor Day is May 1st, right? Um, but as you may know, Labor Day is actually in the United States celebrated the first Monday in September, right? Um, that was because of the Pullman strike that I just explained to you. Literally weeks after the Pullman strike was destroyed, the US Congress created a holiday to honor labor, ironically, but put it not on May 1st, which was um, connected to the eight hour day strikes of 1886, but instead um, put it uh, in the first Monday in September to basically create historical amnesia about the birth of Labor Day, which in fact is the case. Very few Americans know that Labor Day worldwide is May 1st and was born in America, even though it's not celebrated in America on that day, right? Like, uh, and so it was actually, Hardy spoke at the first Labor Day events that Chicago would have held in 1895. Right. And then with an Englishman named Thomas Morgan, who was a resident of Chicago and a labor leader, um, took a train about 80K um, to uh, Woodstock, Illinois, where Debs was doing his six month prison, right? Um, small town in Northeastern Illinois. And it was at that time that Debs, um, who was receiving visitors all the time, um, his prison was prison, but he was comfortable and the jailer basically let him visit with anyone who visit came by, right? And so um, Hardy and Morgan and Hardy's personal secretary who was traveling with them spent a day in Woodstock with Debs um, where they had a nice time talking supposedly. Um, Hardy was said to have left behind some writings by Karl Kautsky, who some of you may be familiar with. He was a Czech, Austrian, um, German rank language socialist, very influential in the German SPD and a very influential theoretician of socialism in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, not I, my sense is not very well known or regarded, um, but in the early 20th century was sort of a big deal, right? Um, we don't know, however, I was trying to poke around going, what text might um, party have given, right? Um, Debs, and the answer is I don't know the answer because it's also figuring out what was translated into English by 1895, because some of Kowski's texts were translated at a later date. Anyway, if anyone wants to find that out, please tell me if you do, right? Like, uh, um, but uh, we know that Kowski was left behind. Um, and we know that um, Hardy later wrote about this experience um, in 1908. So, almost 20, uh, or, uh, you know, what, 13 years later, um, talked about visiting him. He misremembered the name of the town, Woodville, not uh, as opposed to Woodstock, right? Um, and that they talked about socialism together, right? Now, remember that Debs is the greatest labor leader in America in 1895, right? Um, that he's just led one of the most important strikes, right? Um, and so that Hardy wants to see Debs, it's not surprising at all, right? Um, Debs was actually a prominent figure already. Um, and then it comes to pass that, uh, well, Debs will ultimately convert to socialism. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, Hardy traveled onward on that trip in 1895. He traveled all the way to the West Coast. Um, he spent time in the Rocky Mountain West, um, including in Butte, Montana, pictured here, which at that time was the um, copper mining um, capital of the country um, and was nicknamed the richest hill on earth. Um, because of the fabulous wealth, uh, copper being a crucial industrial metal, right? Um, I also have read that um, Hardy spent some time in Butte and met a Scottish barkeeper who broke out some bagpipes, right? Um, when Hardy was spending a little time in Butte, although Butte was better known for its Irish miners, they were Scottish there too, yeah. Um, of course, famously Debs will move towards socialism. There's a sort of a few different organizations, mostly obscure, and it, but in 1901, Debs will help found the Socialist Party of America, the SPA, um, which would have been the equivalent of labor or the SPD um, uh, in the United States, keeping in mind, of course, that working class men, um, that there's no property qualifications on voting in America going back to the 1820s, really. So like um, very different, right? Where there's almost universal male suffrage Right, um, and after 1870, black men too, right? Um, Native Americans wouldn't get the right to vote until the 1920s, although in some places not until the 1950s, right? Like, uh, so um, Debs is an popular labor leader. He's also a popular political figure. Um, he also will help found an important labor union called the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, uh, in Chicago in 1905, the American Federation of Labor was seen as basically weak. It also was seen as um, chose not to organize women, people of color, most immigrants, et cetera. In other words, they chose to not organize most workers, right? Um, and so the industrial workers of the world was going to be anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-xenophobic, 
as well as socialist, right? Um, and that's why uh, Mother Jones, originally from Ireland, right? Um, Eugene Debs, Lucy Parsons, the widow of Harry, um, Albert Parsons, one of the Haymarket martyrs um, and others found in Chicago in 1905, the IWW. Some people, including Debs, thought the IWW would be a sort of a trade union wing of the Socialist Party. There was a lot of people who were both Wobblies and Socialist Party members, although by the early 19 teens, there was a split increasingly as the IWW started to reject electoral approaches, right? Um, what, what you might call evolutionary or democratic socialism was not the IWW game. They saw sort of a general strike at the workplace is where workers were strongest. And so therefore um, had a very different vision, right? Um, and so there was still a lot of overlap, but they actually end up not playing, um, not being as closely allied as they might. Hardy um, will travel to um, the United States on several more occasions, as Pauline mentioned. The second time was in 1908. Um, he's excited to see um, the uh, country, um, including that the Socialist Party uh, with his um, sort of uh, comrade Eugene Debs at the lead, who ran for president in 1904, ran for president in 1908. Hardy is very excited, writes about um, Debs's campaign in 1908. Um, the truth is, is that 1908 wasn't a great year for the socialists, although at the local level, Socialist Party um, people are getting elected, especially at the, say, for mayor or city council, um, state legislatures. There are actually hundreds of elected Socialist Party members in the early 1900s, especially in the Midwest, um, but also around the country. 1912 is when Debs did um, his best in terms of electoral outcomes in a presidential race. In 1912, Debs ran again and he won about 6% of the popular vote. 6% of the popular vote was the highest that a socialist has ever gotten in the United States in a presidential election. Um, this map on the right actually shows you that in a number of states, the socialists were in double digits, even though the low double digits, and so that's noteworthy. Um, these are places often where industrialism is newer and rougher, right? Uh, especially the mining West, right? Where um, you had radical unions, but also radical, radical politics. Um, and that's sort of interesting. We might talk about that, right? Um, World begins, of course, a couple years later in 1914. As you all know, Keir Hardy, um, even before the war began, was a principled opponent to this sort of war and spoke out both before and after the British declaration of war. Um, and advocated for a general strike, perhaps. Um, Kautsky, incidentally, was also anti-war, um, opposed the German parties voting for war credits. Um, the United States Socialist Party, which is smaller and less important in national politics, is anti-war. Um, and generally speaking, those on the left um, were anti-war as well as anti-conscription, even though not every organization necessarily took a formal opposition. The Socialist Party did actually um, take a formal opposition to the US war once the United States declared war in 1917, right? The spring of 1917, Debs um, famously is anti-war and gives, um, well, some speeches, but the image on the bottom right is of him in a small town called Canton, Ohio, where he gave uh, his most famous anti-war speech in which he denounced um, the war for the reasons that most socialists um, might denounce the war, that working class people will be asked to dip, die and kill, whereas wealthy people in power will be the ones who largely benefit and don't suffer the consequences directly of war, right? Um, Deb said it better than me, um, but nevertheless, that's the sort of roughly what Debs' opposition was, similar to what Keir Hardy's, from my understanding, right? Um, of course, by this time in the United States, the US government had passed laws that criminalized dissent. And so Eugene Debs um, was arrested for criticizing the war. And then in 1918, um, on, went on trial and was found guilty of violating the Espionage Act and was sentenced to 10 years in prison um, for um, speaking against the war, right? Um, it was at that time that he gave one of his more famous speeches at his trial um, with the sort of the money line being the one I've included here. While there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal class element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Of course, Debs went to prison first in West Virginia at a federal facility, then transferred to Atlanta, Georgia, where he spent the rest of his time, right? And it was while in prison that Eugene Debs actually ran for president for the last time. Um, Prisoner 9653, who um, got approximately 1 million votes um, while sitting in a federal prison cell, quite dramatic. Um, 
After about two and a half years, President Warren Harding, um, it was Wilson who had been president during the war, um, commuted Debs' sentence around Christmas 1921. Thousands of people had been in prison, including many Wobblies. And by 1921, 1922, the great majority had been had their sentences commuted. Um, and then at a later date, FDR actually pardoned many of these people in the early 1930s. Um, although Debs had written a great deal, he never had written a book before. But in his final years of life, after getting out of prison, he actually wrote a book which was published posthumously called Walls and Bars. Um, and in that book, um, he uh, actually had a lot of things to say which seemed very timely given in America and other countries sort of focus on mass incarceration, um, including noting that uh, basically, who do you find in prison? Poor people, right, um, especially. And that uh, really the system is indicted um, if you find lots of people in prison, rich people, of course, can buy their way out of prison or never go in the first place, right? And so that's why, among other reasons, um, Deb said capitalism and crime have almost become synonymous and that uh, yeah, the system should not be merely reformed but abolished. Those are his terms, right? Um, and that the only way to basically do that it would be to abolish capitalism, um, that uh, society can only succeed, quote, by taking the jail out of man as well as taking man out of jail. Right. Um, uh, so there's actually we could talk more about sort of Debs's views on um, prison, as I actually um, am starting to think more about. Um, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He actually had long been sick. I noticed that Keir Hardy also went through bouts of illness throughout his life, um, working class lives, traveling a lot, um, under a lot of pressure. Um, and so Debs was um, really sort of weak after he got out of prison and sort of convalesced in Terre Haute. Um, and then passed away at the age of 70 in 1926. So just to sort of wrap this up, well, it should be obvious how much in common Hardy and Debs really shared, um, had um, shared thoughts, um, principled opposition to World War I, working class kids who had gotten work, uh, sort of industrial jobs um, in their youth, went into, came to appreciate quickly the power of unions and then sort of worked for many years to sort of um, organize unions and grow them, um, got involved in politics, um, also sort of um, became along the way anti-capitalist and sort of socialist politics. Um, what might Debs and Hardy think of um, our times? Well, who knows? Um, I can tell you that in 19, excuse me, in 2021 in the United States among so-called millennials, those born since the um, year 2000, my students, right, like many of my students and others perhaps among who are teachers, you know, millennial generations can be sort of our easy sort of prey or sort of they're often picked on by older people, which really annoys me, even though I'm also older. Um, you know, it's the largest generation in US history. It's also the most diverse generation. And although it's sort of the political spectrum among millennials is as vast as in any generation, um, Many young people in America are pretty progressive, right? Like the reason that we're hearing subjects like Medicare for all, Green New Deal, et cetera, coming out of the United States isn't being driven from the old, right? Although Bernie Sanders is the most well-known socialist in America, it's really being driven by the young, right? Um, again, not to over to push that too far. It's not like you um, walk down the street and you find a young person talking about the Green New Deal. Um, but nevertheless, um, we do see that um, young people are more anti-racist, I'd say, um, more critical of capitalism, um, and really have sort of been delivered a sort of a crappy bill of goods, right? I mean, the, 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 the financial crash of 2007 through 10, um, followed by COVID um, in between Trump, right? Um, they, uh, lots of them are very critical of the system, right? Um, now, Keir Hardy, of course, was as well, right? And I um, just wanted to sort of part with one nice quote from Hardy, right, from 1908, where he's enthusiastic about um, uh, America. His, this quote that he wrote is about America, right? Um, Novelists, preachers, poets, and essayists are speaking out courageously and strongly on the side of the new year, which socialism will one day inaugurate. Whilst the American magazines discuss it seriously month by month, even the daily press is awakening to the fact that socialism is here. Um, not to overstate it again too much, um, but the democratic socialists of America was moribund in the, um, the United States for decades, right? Um, the fact that there's now over 100,000 members where five years ago there were 5,000, um, that's not insignificant. Um, and so um, 
if we want to be hopeful, and I personally do, right? Like, um, then I think, well, I honestly think that Debs was a hopeful person. And from what little I know about Hardy, he was too. I mean, because socialists, as uh, Deb said, I am for socialism because I am for humanity, right? Like, uh, um, and so I think that's, of course, the, many, the same reason that many of us today feel that way is because um, we share these, these sort of commonsensical views. So um, for those of you who wanna read more about Eugene Debs, well, there's many options, but um, uh, two years ago, a graphic biography of Eugene Debs was published in the United States. Um, it was co-published by the Democratic Socialists of America and a publisher called Verso Press. Right, um, that it was published and in graphic form is somewhat telling. Um, although uh, just to sort of upset your sort of um, guess, um, uh, Paul Buell who helped create this biography is actually a new lefty, meaning that he was a radical in the 1960s who stayed radical, right? Um, and so it was this man, Paul Buell, who was actually the driving force behind this graphic biography. Um, although it is many young people who also read graphic books. Right, not just older people like Paul Buell. Um, thanks again to all of you, but especially to Pauline and the rest of you in the Cure Hearted Society. It's a pleasure and an honor to sort of be with you uh, virtually today. And um, hopefully that was um, educational and maybe enjoyable. Yeah. Well, Peter, I thoroughly enjoyed that. That was uh, an excellent talk and the, um, the uh, side 